test for the vacuum regulator? Yep, with a gauge hooked to the regulated vacuum connection, you should get an off reading between zero and two inches. Full on should indicate full manifold vacuum. As I mentioned earlier, the standard and auto temp models are practically the same, except for controls. The auto temp controls are the same as in previous models, with the aspirator and the control unit assembly in their familiar places. The water valve thermostat is on the left side of the evaporator housing. If the air conditioner is moved over to the right, how about the heater? The heater is also moved, Bob, and the blower and heater housing extends into the engine compartment and under the right fender. Here again, you have to drop the wheel housing to get at the blower or the heater housing. Right now, it's time to talk about engine changes, Pete. Okay, Tech. We'll begin with cleaner air system changes. The vacuum advance control valve is now used only on the 170 cubic inch 6 with manual transmission and all 426 Hemi V8s. To further reduce emissions, cooling system thermostat opening temperatures are now 10 degrees higher than before. The thermostat ratings are 200 degrees on the 170 cubic inch 6 and 190 on all other engines. All of our 340 V8s now have the camshaft previously installed only on the automatic transmission combinations. Using this camshaft in the manual transmission combinations reduces emissions and improves low speed operation. I noticed that something new has been added to the Holly four barrel carburetor. Oh, you mean the choke valve protector rod? It's located over the choke valve to guard against valve damage when the air cleaner is being serviced. The Carter AVS carburetor used on cars with air conditioning has a hot idle compensator valve in the secondary section. This valve leans out the rich mixtures which result from high underhood temperatures. Here's how it works. At normal temperatures, the compensator valve is held closed by a bimetallic spring. When underhood temperatures climb, the valve opens and air passage directly to the intake manifold. And don't tinker with a compensator valve or you'll upset the calibration. What's the story on the Holly single barrel carburetor? The Holly single barrel carburetor now has a two-stage power valve for better performance and economy. The economizer diaphragm plunger brings each valve stage into operation as required. In addition, there's a new plastic limiter cap on the idle mixture adjusting screw. This cap, also used on some Carter carburetors, limits the adjusting range for proper engine idling and emission control. And one final carburetion item. Both of our sixes have a new anti-icing feature. Filtered air passes through a manifold tube where it is heated by exhaust gas. The heated air is then admitted below the throttle valve to reduce icing. Now on ignition, the distributor used on V8s no longer has adjustable anchors for the centrifugal governor springs. If the advance mechanism is out of calibration, the complete shaft assembly must be replaced. And most 69 distributors have new cams, so be sure to check the dwell specs. It's a good thing all these details are covered in the reference book or I'd be lost. What's next, Pete? Well, Torque Flight has a new pressure relief valve to prevent excessive pressure in reverse. This pressure really builds up when frigid temperatures chill the fluid. And on the subject of valves, throttle valve and kick down valve diameters are smaller and the springs are softer to make the valves easier to move. This improvement reduces the effort needed to push down the accelerator pedal. To simplify switching, the neutral start switch now includes the backup warning light switch. A telescoping metal core in the plastic switch plunger extends and allows the backup contacts in the combination switch to close when the manual valve lever is in reverse position. A torque flight auxiliary oil cooler is used when a trailer towing package is installed on our full-size cars, which are powered by the 383 V8 with a four-barrel carburetor. A similar cooler is installed on Imperials equipped for trailer towing. Now, moving on to the steering system. There's a new tilt-type steering wheel option for the full-size Plymouth and Dodge cars. This wheel is adjustable to seven tilt positions five degrees apart, but does not have telescoping action. Three new tools are needed to service the tilt wheel. A special 12-sided socket wrench must be used to remove or adjust the steering shaft upper bearing nut. The turn signal cover also requires new remover and installer tools. The roller type power steering pump introduced in 68 is now improved. A new seal plate and gasket provide better sealing at the bottom of the main cavity in the pump body. Also, the outlet passages in the cam ring and pressure plate are enlarged to increase pump efficiency. 
Because model applications are now wider, various pulleys are used with the roller type pump. To accommodate these pulleys, you'll have to use a new adapter and spacer with the present pulley installing tool. Time's running out, Pete. You'd better get into the brakes. Right. First, you'll notice the new 11-inch drums and 15-inch wheels used on the full-size models. Front drums are ribbed for better cooling and greater rigidity. Rear drums also have ribs plus flared rims for improved cooling. The automatic brake adjuster is redesigned to prevent over-adjustment and will come in as a running change on all models. The adjuster thread is reversed and the adjusting lever is now below the star wheel, so the adjustment takes place as the brakes are applied instead of when they are released. Since the automatic brake adjuster thread is reversed, star wheel adjusting movement is also reversed. Now you move the adjusting tool handled upward to tighten and downward to set the initial adjustment. Now as for disc brakes, a new single piston disc brake is used on our full size cars, except Imperials. When the brakes are applied, the caliper moves inward on two guide pins in an adapter casting which is mounted on the steering knuckle. Pressure reaction between the caliper and its piston causes the shoes to clamp the disc. Here's how it works. Hydraulic pressure forces the piston and the floating caliper to move in opposite directions. Since the caliper extends over the rim of the disc, its inward movement pulls the outer brake shoe against the outer side of the disc, while the piston pushes the inner shoe against the opposite side. Both shoes are clamped with equal force because the pressure reaction between the piston and caliper is the same for both parts. When the hydraulic pressure is released, positioner springs on the guide pins retract the caliper. As with some other disc brakes, the single piston brake caliper must be dismounted for brake relining. Complete relining information is given in the service manual, so we won't repeat it here. Okay, Pete, you've only got a few minutes to talk about axles. Well, there's a new eight and a quarter inch axle coming up, but there'll probably be a tech session on it before long, so we'll just give it once over lightly. The new axle is similar in general design to our present seven and a quarter inch unit. However, unlike the smaller axle, it has threaded adjusters instead of shims for differential side bearing adjustment. Axle shaft bearings are the straight roller type without a conventional inner race. The seal and bearing rollers ride directly on a journal surface ground on the axle shaft. For removal, the shaft can be pulled out of the bearing without removing the bearing assembly. The axle shafts are kept in place by C-shaped retainers in ring grooves on the inner ends of the shafts. The retainers are locked in by the side gears when the differential pinion shaft is installed. The new axle has a collapsible spacer to set and maintain pinion bearing preload. Some eight and three quarter inch axles, which also have this collapsible spacer, are identified in the reference book. When you replace the pinion oil seal or yoke on one of these jobs, be sure to follow the special procedure given in the service manuals, or gear damage will result. The final item on our list is the new cone-type sure grip differential option for the seven and a quarter and eight and three quarter inch axles. The new unit has steel cone clutches which are held against seats in the sides of the differential case by coil springs. Under load, differential side gear reaction forces the clutch cones into their seats to provide sure grip action. The clutch cones are a matched fit in the differential case, so the new differential is serviced only as a complete unit. A new type of lubricant is specified for refilling cone type sure grip axles. The special lube for the plate type sure grip must still be used in those axles, but not in cone type assemblies. And now, it's time to bring down the curtain on this session. There are many other 69 features that are not covered here, but we've reviewed the most important servicing highlights. As usual, you'll find additional information in your reference book for this session. And for a sign-off tip, be sure to look over the new specs when you check your service manuals. That's it, fellas. So long till the next meeting.